Oh, thank you so much, Tim and Pam. That was such a good word from God. I appreciate that. And I, in my effort to listen, I forgot to put my offering in there. Uh, but God will take it whenever we remember it. Amen? Uh, this week has been so much fun. I, I know I'm on social media. Not everyone is. But on social media, I have loved seeing friends post back-to-school pictures. And a lot of them who have a senior, uh, they have their first back-to-school picture, and then their senior year back-to-school picture. And I love seeing the change and the growth in those pictures from the very beginning to, to this new milestone. It is amazing to see that change. That change is not only physical. I know we heard Arya say I didn't, she didn't want to go back to school, but she wants to learn. And I think we all want to learn, uh, but we all grow in our knowledge over time. And this does not happen by accident. It is the result of parents pouring into their children, grandparents, loving family members, pouring into their children, administrators, coaches, and teachers. They pour into their children what they know so that those children can learn and grow. The same thing can happen in our church, and I pray that it does. We don't want to remain as we are. All of us should want to grow in our faith, grow in our knowledge and faith. We have a mission statement that serves as a guide for us as we walk with Jesus. Here it is. At Barnesville First United Methodist Church, we make disciples of Jesus Christ by inviting every person into a kind and compassionate community where they can know God's love and engage in worship, small groups, and Ministries where we inspire, strengthen, and challenge one another to grow in faith and intentionally show God's love to our neighbors. In this way, we are part of how God is transforming Barnesville, Lamar County, and the world. It encompasses all the important things for growing our faith, for growing in our faith. And as good as it is, it's a little long, so it's hard to remember. Amen? Uh, so we could sum it up at the goal of our mission statement in one sentence. We commit to closing the gap between who we are and who we want to be in Christ. This is the goal for us as a church and as individuals. Over the past few weeks, we've broken down our mission statement into five bite-sized pieces, five practices that if we did them every single day, we would close the gap between who we are, and who we want to be in Christ. This is how we live into our mission statement of making disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. Here are the five practices. We worship God in public and in private. We take steps to grow our faith. We love and serve God and others. We give generously to God and others, and we share our faith with others. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about sharing our faith. Now, come on. Don't be nervous. I want to encourage you to come. I've got some things to think about that you may not have thought of before. But this week, today, we're going to focus on giving. We have several scripture passages we're going to be looking at today. And I want to begin with Matthew 6, 19 through 20. But first, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are acceptable to you my rock and my redeemer. I pray you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. Amen. Hear now the word of God from Matthew 6, 19 and 20. And I'm actually going to read 21. That's not going to be on the screen or in your bulletin, but I'm going to give you one more verse. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you read the paper this week, you've heard some of this before, but one of my favorite memories from when my time my time when my children, my own children, were in school was all the things they brought home. Don't you just love seeing what they've been doing at school, the little pictures they color and 
kindergarten all the way up to the papers they write. I actually have papers that my daughter wrote in high school. Who has that? I mean, are you with me? I save those things. They are just such treasured mementos for me. I have boxes upon boxes of mementos and pictures and memories. And of course, our children range in age from 31 to 35, so you can imagine there's a lot of stuff in my house. Amen? In fact, it took us three 26-foot trucks to get it all here. I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I stand before you as someone who is not perfect. I have, I have, I have to admit, I have more than I need. I have kept more than I should. And I posted the article that was in the paper on Facebook, and I've gotten great ideas. They said, take pictures of it, and that way that's just one little picture, and that takes up a lot less space. And I'm like, amen. I've actually started doing that, but it's a process when you've got so much stuff to get pictures of, of all of it. We have more than we need. We keep more than we should. Now, for me, it's family mementos, but it could be something else for you. It could be shoes. It could be purses. It could be ties. It could be tools. It could be dishes or cars or books. The list goes on. Chances are we all have more than we need. We all keep more than we should. Scripture is clear. We are to collect treasures that last. We're to focus on things with eternal significance. Our treasure is here. This is our treasure, the living word of God. Amen? Everything we need to know for salvation is here. All we have to do is read it. Our treasure is a relationship with Christ. Out of the abundance of all we have, God calls us to be generous with God and generous with others. Early in my ministry, someone shared two theologies with me, and and, um, I recall the lesson well. He said that there's one theology called a theology of scarcity, and there's another theology called a theology of abundance. In the theology of scarcity... We hold on to what we have because we fear it won't be enough that we'll run out. In a theology of abundance, we give all we have knowing that the God who is able will provide everything we need. I want to live, I encourage you to live out of a theology of abundance. Luke 6.38 supports the theology of abundance. And again, I'm going to mess with things a little bit, and I'm going to start a little bit earlier than the words on the screen in your bulletin say. I want to start with verse 37 in Luke 6. It says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. So you see here the generosity, the, the giving spirit is not just about money. It's about our lives, our attitudes, the way we treat, the way we love and accept others. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I love that passage. I heard a story once that illustrated that well illustrates the theology of abundance. It's the story of a farmer who's riding down the road in a wagon, and the wagon is filled with bags of grain. And he passes a traveler on the road, and the traveler stops, and he says, man, can you spare some grain? And the farmer takes out a very small, a wee bag, puts one little scoop of the grain into that bag and hands it to the man. And then this traveler opens up this huge chest that's in the back of his buggy. And it's filled with gold coins. And the traveler scoops out just a few of those coins and gives it to the man with the grain. And as that farmer was riding away, 
he could not help but think, if I had given him all that I have, would he have given me all that he had? Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Let's think about this in modern day terms. Our bank statements provide a snapshot of our generosity, our checkbooks, our debit card registers. Where do we spend our money? Is it all going to meet our children's financial needs? Is it going to pay for our home, our cars, our travel, our hobbies, or season tickets to our football team? None of those things in and of themselves are bad. What we want to look at here is, what do we give to God? Have we fallen prey to those voices in our head that say, if I just had a little more, I would be happy. If I just had that one more tool, I'd be happy. If I just had that one more thing, I'd be happy. And so we're feverishly storing up our treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy and thieves will steal. Or do we realize that God is enough? When we finally grasp that concept, our world changes. When we surrender who we are and everything to God, that is enough. The good life is not measured by the amount of money we have or the things we accumulate. The good life is measured by what we do with all that God has given us. One quote I ran across puts it in perspective. It said, it's not a matter of how much of my money I will give to God, but how much of God's money I will keep for myself. All we have comes from God. Just as we are richly blessed by God, we also receive blessing when we give generously to God and to others. In Acts 20, 35, Paul is encouraging the early church to be generous as he has been generous. And I'm picking up at verse 35. He says, in all this, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We probably all have stories of times we have given and received a far greater blessing than the one we've given to. I am here to testify that we are not going to find the good life on Amazon and eBay and Etsy and Facebook Marketplace. We're not going to find the good life there. We find the good life God promises when we are content with what we already have. When we recognize the greatest treasure of all is life with Christ. And we reflect our gratitude by being generous with God and others. Winston Churchill puts it like this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So church, what do our checkbooks say about the kind of life we're making? Are we being generous with God and others? You know, God has given us the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity to experience new life in Christ. And I cannot think of a more generous gift. We'll remember that gift when we come to the Lord's table today. So how will we respond? I pray we respond by giving generously to God and to others. To help us grow toward that goal, I want to give us a tangible challenge. For this month, the challenge is to strengthen our giving muscle. Uh, all of our giving muscles need to be strengthened a little bit. Think of five ways to be even more generous this month. 
Now, we are already a generous congregation. I've seen the way you love and care for each other. I see your generosity every day. So I know uh, this is a real challenge. Be, be more generous. How can we be even more generous? It could be taking more than the quiet, required list of classroom supplies that a teacher needs. You think about all the money that teachers spend on their classrooms, and they send a list home to parents, and a lot of folks think of how can I spend the least amount of money to get by with giving what's needed on this list. Instead, let's give more, more than they request. Give them two of everything instead of one. Could be something as simple as buying the food for the person behind you in the drive-thru. Could be placing more than your tithe in the offering plate. It could be sponsoring one prisoner in the Kairos prison ministry. You know that's a ministry I'm passionate about. Do you know that it cost $125 for a resident of the prison to go through that weekend? There are six residents at a table, so sponsoring all six would be $625. Some people can give $10 for a meal. Some people could sponsor a table. Five times this month, Let's think of ways to be more generous with God and with others. This is one of the ways we close the gap between who we are and who we want to be in Christ. May it be so in our lives today. Amen.